clear break well above 2500 on its way to 3000 and silver, you know, $35, $40 heading towards 50 And, and, and so I, I'm getting past the next few days or a few weeks until we have this fall meeting. Yeah, we could you know, flounder either side of a couple of dollars on silver and $100 or so on gold, but they still have substantial upside potential. And again, the worst case scenario is, is to buy it and hope it doesn't go up because most people steal assets are based in financial assets not hard assets well i think the, the bottom line uh, peter is that i mean uh, how many more dollars pounds euros will it cost me to buy gold uh, in a month six months a year from now uh, even if i'm sitting at a table how many more dollars euros and etc will it cost to buy that table even i mean it, it really it's just the amount of money printing. It's 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 not that your house has gone up in value either. It's just simply costing more fiat, debasing fiat currencies to buy the same bloody thing. In today's news recap, silver jumps higher after U.S. jobs figures silver prices powered up above the $31 an ounce level on Friday to hit a three-week high, taking a lead from stronger gold prices as U.S. economic data strengthened the case for interest rate cuts. Prices briefly notched up a high of $31.71 and announced the highest price for silver since June 12. That compared with around $30.40 and announced in late deals on Thursday. Both gold and silver reacted positively to us data released Friday which painted a dimmer picture on the economy, playing into expectations that the U.S. Fed will start to slash interest rates this autumn. Friday also saw the return of the U.S. markets after the July 4 Independence Day holiday. Silver came back down off the highs to trade at around $31.24 an ounce in late deals on Friday, holding comfortably above the $31 figure. Silver's impressive performance through the week ending July 5 has begun to challenge a bearish trend that's been in place since late May when prices traded as high as $32.70 an ounce. Support at below $29 an ounce has held firm in June, helping to build a solid base from which prices have pushed back up toward the May highs. Looking ahead, attention will turn to Tuesday for speeches by U.S. Fed officials, including testimony from Fed Chair Jerome Powell, for any further signals on the outlook for monetary policy. Data from interest rate traders points to an expected 78% probability of a U.S. interest rate cut at the Fed's meeting on September 18, with a 92% chance that the central bank will keep rates on hold at the next meeting set for July 31st. Take a little time to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. You can also check out our other videos on gold and silver and drop your comments and observations in the comments section below. Everything you do helps with the YouTube algorithm and immensely contributes to the channel's growth. Thanks and enjoy the video. So when I last spoke at shows, I used to get the irk of silver investors because I'd always say silver was the kissing cousin to gold and that I would always own more gold than I would own silver. But what I've said of late to people is the fundamental argument for silver has changed dramatically for the better. There is so much more industrial usage for it, and the known supply and demand scenario has turned extremely bullish for it. So I believe you should be equal weight in it. But let me also point this to you. If you went out and polled 100 American financial advisors now in any part of our country and said, since the new millennium started, what has performed better? Stocks, bonds, and gold. They'd all say stocks, They'll say bonds second and then gold. And then when you show them that gold has outperformed even the stock market for almost 25 years, they scratch their head and go, I didn't know that. And yet so few people have that exposure to it. So I think an equal breakdown in it is worthy of it. I do think that there tends to be a, a tendency among individual investors to take uh, quantity over so-called quality in the sense that they like to have 10,000 shares of a dollar stock versus a thousand shares of a $10 stock, mm -hmm. even though it's the same amount of money. But I really believe gold and silver uh, belong on the same level now. And uh, both, I think my feeling on this is we've been halfway through this move. There's another half to go. It's probably not as straight up, but the next big push is going to come when that news breaks and people realize what the BRICS are doing with gold. And that's going to be where we get that, you know, clear break well above 2500 on its way to 3000 and silver, you know, $35, $40 heading towards 50 And, and, and so I, I'm 
getting past the next few days or a few weeks until we have this fall meeting, yeah, we could you know, flounder either side of a couple of dollars on silver and a hundred dollars or so on gold, but they still have substantial upside potential. And again, the worst case scenario is, is to buy it and hope it doesn't go up because most people steal assets are based in financial assets, not hard assets. Well, I think the, the bottom line, uh, Peter, is that, I mean, uh, how many more dollars, pounds, euros will it cost me to buy gold uh, in a month, six months, a year from now? Uh, even if I'm sitting at a table, how many more dollars, euros and et cetera, will it cost to buy that table even? I mean, it, it really, it's just the amount of money printing. It's, it's, it's not that your house has gone up in value either. It's just simply costing more fiat, debasing fiat currencies to buy the same bloody thing. And, and I think this is to me, um, it, it is mind bogglingly simple, um, but, but it's, as you say, it's elusive to uh, some of the brightest minds out there. But I really thank you for drawing your attention to um, and giving your sage view of, of this because people should look and see you know, some of these people, some people that we're talking, that they're listening here, haven't been around very long and, and are really looking for um, information um, to make good choices. And I think this is why it's so valuable, Peter, um, that someone of your um, provenance can come along and give your opinion because you have, a, you have experience that many, many people don't have. And it helps everybody to make up their own mind which is really what this is all about to me. Well, I'll just say this, and it's probably sent out mostly to the crypto uh, people, especially the young folks that are in it. I like to say this, and both of us fit this bill. Just because we have gray hair and no hair doesn't mean we've lost our mind. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I take experience over anything they could tell me in, in a class somewhere or in some book that might have worked 40 or 50 years ago. But if you haven't had hands-on experience, no, those books are basically useless. In today's news recap, gold price jumps ahead of Fed Powell's testimony. The gold price rebounds in Tuesday's early European session. Rising rates cut expectations and safe haven flows might cap the precious metals downside. Pausing China's PBOC gold purchases will likely weigh on Zhao USD in the near term. The gold price XAU USD gains momentum amid the weaker US dollar USD during the early European session on Tuesday. The downside for the precious metal might be limited as traders raise their bets that the U.S. Federal Reserve Fed would cut interest rates in September following softest employment data last week. Additionally, the cautious mood amid the political uncertainties in France and geopolitical tensions in the Middle East might boost the gold price, a traditional safe haven asset. Nonetheless, gold prices might be dragged lower by the People Bank of China's PBOC decision not to buy gold for a second straight month in June. Gold traders will monitor Fed Chair Jerome Powell's semi-annual congressional testimony, along with the speeches from Fed's Michael Barr and Michelle Bowman. On Thursday, the U.S. Consumer Price Index CPI inflation data will take center stage. The Chinese central bank kept gold buying on hold for the second month in June, according to official data released on Sunday. China, the world's largest gold consumer, kept its gold holdings unchanged for the second consecutive month in June, after 18 months of purchases. These figures indicated that its reserves remained at 72.8 million ounces, valued at roughly $170 billion. This looks like a lot of profit taking, and the equities are strong, and this morning here, which kind of has a little bit of a competing factor with precious metals. Said Bob Habercorn, senior market strategist at RJO Futures. Financial markets have priced in a nearly 76% chance of a Fed rate cut in September, up from 71% last Friday, according to the CME FedWatch tool. The U.S. CPI inflation is expected to ease to 3.1% YOE in June from 3.3% in May, while core inflation is estimated to remain steady at 3.4% YOE in the same reported period. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview but first hit the like button smash the subscribe button and turn on notifications, so you do not miss out on our daily recap check our description for more info and full video credits, and enjoy the episode. You touched on, um, you touched on EVs, you touched on uh, metals and copper and things coming into short supply. If we now bring in the BRICS 
currency. Now, obviously, we, we've done a lot of work on this. Uh, we have some very good contacts um, who um, who are working, who actually set, set the agenda for uh, some of these upcoming BRICS meetings. And by October, we really do understand that uh, well before the US election, for obvious reasons before the US election, that this currency will be launched. And, and in fact, we have, and I've been public on this, the beta testing for this currency started in February and that the beta testing for this, which is, we understand to be 40% backed by gold, um, is going to drive the price uh, or, or rather be assistive in setting the price for the what is going to be the multi what is a multi trillion dollar trade, which is the oil, energy, uh, grains, which is are produced and consumed by the global south, of which I think some 38, 40 um, BRICS members will comprise. So I guess really what I'm leading at here is, and I know that you have strong opinions of this, is that if that's the case, Peter, which we believe it is, and then we start to see commodities priced in gold, essentially, or backed by gold, what the heck's that going to do when you want to buy oil or commodities in dollars? Well, Andrew, you better not wait two more years to talk to me again. I always love hearing you speak, and you're one of the bright minds that I know of. And I, I read recently when you wrote about that, and that was so intriguing because I'm a big believer in the BRICS. I believe, in fact, let me take a step back and he just put it. So I believe there's five key factors for Americans as Americans, I can't speak for Europeans, but as Americans, they should build what I call a financial lock. That's what I started stated in March. One we all know about, we can talk about to the cows come home, the, the debt and deficits. That's We're going to get to a point soon where we're going to have a problem paying just the interest. Second, in America, we have a huge retirement and aging crisis. Third, and it's around the world, you got it too, we have an immigration invasion. And it, there are economic consequences that people don't understand. I'm going to skip to the fifth one. We also have here in America political paralysis. We have two parties that can no longer work together, be in the same room, and each has a splintering within their group, moving in the opposite direction of the main middle ground. But the fourth reason I've told people, and I've said it's the most overlooked economic decision that Wall Street has messed up on, probably in, in, in modern times, will be the misunderstanding and not appreciating what is happening with the BRIC nations. You and I exchange that stuff, so we know each of us have been speaking about that. It is unbelievable to talk. I gave a talk recently to some young advisors, and I said to them, let me ask you something. If even if it only ends up 20 or 30 countries, that's 20 and 30 countries that used to deal with the United States in a big way and now won't be. How's that beneficial to the United States? How does the BRICS benefit the United States? It doesn't. It is so negative. And again, again, you being ahead of the time like you were about the manipulation. I absolutely agree with you. I don't have the contacts you have, but it's important when people like you talk about it because I know you do. There's no question that this big movement in gold that occurred in my mind, Andy, and I know I'm singing to the choir, but if I was being on national TV, I'd say the same thing right now happen not for a trade, not for speculation, but because people believe an alternative is going to be necessary, even on just on a regional basis to start. And eventually, because people are just going to see that trusting paper is a lost cause when everything goes to hell in a handbasket in the United States. And where is it going to be used? It's going to be used by the groups in the BRICS. Now, how they exactly use it, that's your area of expertise. And I always bow to people that I know that are smarter than me, and you are. But I'll just tell you this, you're absolutely right. And I think it's going to be a shock to people. And most people on Wall Street can barely, barely spell BRICS. They have no concept of what has been transpiring, how they've already been, like you said, testing trading, forming associations. Look. Again, here in our media, no one made anything about how the Saudis had just said, you know what, I think we're basically done just with dollars. I think we're willing to sell to whoever we want. And by the way, we're also interested in joining the BRICS as well. It's just, it, it's a phenomena that doesn't shock me because I'll say this, Andy, and then I'll shut up. 
You can toss most financial advisors off the top of the Empire State Building and all the way down, they'll all say the same thing. Hey, so far, so good. Wall Street has this horrific habit of always seeing the cup half full. It doesn't pay to see it half empty. That was my claim to fame. When I was a young guy, three years in the business, forecast the crash. They told me you can't say it, you gotta resign. The crash came the next day, I said everything's gonna be hunky-dory, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how the so-called whiz kid was born. But they do not want to talk about the negatives because negatives don't sell. And by the way, Andy, tying my Catholic Christian face on my sleeve in my business doesn't sell either. I probably lose half the business I would have had otherwise because of that. But it's kept me thinking biblically and recognizing that if you look at that book, even just as an historic book, that it's not the word of God, just a bunch of people got together and for one reason or another said and all that stuff, the valuable information in that book of how to live a life, especially from economics, where half the parables are related to money and factors. There's more verses about matters of finance as there are about what you would think would be the two big topics, hell or heaven. And so uh, people do not understand what is happening on the world stage, how the United States is going to be outside looking in and how important the BRIC movement is. I, I call it this, Andy, and then I'll shut up. Sorry. I said the BRIC nations, when done within three to five years tops, will have more impact or at least equal to world trade than the industrial revolution did. And young people look here, what are you, crazy? It's just a bunch of few countries and whatever. Okay, we'll see. That's phenomenal. Uh, and and I, I totally, I get that. And I think um, I think what you, you sort of also touched on, you know, there's almost a biblical side to this too, because what we're dealing with here is the unraveling of a unipolar um, power, hegemonic power, who has probably caused more wars and destruction around the world. Uh, and primarily about, uh, it's triggered by anyone who's ever tried to get uh, to trade oil other than on the dollar, the dollar, which is currently Russia in, in the crosshairs. Um, but I think what, what to me is so wholesome about this is that none of the, this, the BRICS group themselves, there isn't anyone that wants to be a leader. This is a multipolar world where it, it pays to remove the barriers between your borders. It pays to get on with your neighbor. It actually is beneficial and it creates, it's the synergy of creating something much larger than any one of them could do on their own and to me this is to me this is it is biblical in a sense to me of what is going on here and, and for whatever reason um but if you wanted to even try and put a road code together which the bible provides you a road code code but if you wanted to ever put a road code together well really to me what they're trying to do here is is remo is literally become become a trading world that gets on with each other. Thank you for joining us in this insightful discussion with Peter Grandich. If you found this video valuable, make sure to hit the subscribe button, like this video, and leave a comment below with your thoughts. Stay tuned for more expert analysis and financial insights to help you navigate the ever-changing economic landscape.